Okay guys, how are we doing? Um, so we're just gonna try and upload the last, only like five, 10 minutes or so from our session exploring the way in which Napoleon was shaping Europe to his own particular agenda. We're just catching up on the bits that children and wildlife <laughs> didn't allow us to do um, earlier on today. So where we left things was just an exploration of some of the rhetoric that Napoleon was coming out with. Um, exploring his motivations for uh, sort of crafting and evolving the European landscape to, to fit his uh, particular uh, agenda. We have this citation here that he was associated with wanting the title of French citizen to become the finest and most desirable on worth. I want every Frenchman traveling anywhere in Europe to be able to believe himself at home. Now, partially that was cultural, but it was also manifest in political change as well. And one of the things we're talking about next week is the Code Napoleon, this legislative uh, form of uh, reform and evolution that he instigated in a French setting, but tried to roll out and replicate over much of the rest of Europe as well, creating a, a cultural and political climate in which a French person would find themselves to be in a very familiar climate going from place to place. And ultimately, we'll see next week how the Code Napoleon uh, provided the template for so many of the uh, constitutions that would govern European politics and beyond in many nation states um, for uh, not just decades, for a century plus in some instances. So it really had quite a profound impact. It didn't necessarily uh, manifest in the way that Napoleon hoped it would, um, partially because of his defeat. Um, he, he wasn't in a position to make Europe into something that every French person could enjoy. But he did manage to instigate some major political reforms, which we'll talk about uh, next week. One thing that we were about to introduce before we got rudely interrupted um, was the exploration of his personal ambitions. We've already talked about Napoleon uh, trying to cast himself as emperor. Well, he did cast himself as emperor. But emperors and kings really find their legacy in what comes next. And so he positioned his family members in seats of prominence all the way across Europe. And this is either uh, family members through blood, and certainly his brothers uh, are put in uh, senior positions. He's positioning his brothers as kings in various European states, and we'll talk about where they end up in a moment. Um, but also through marriage. Um, he's making those connections and those alliances uh, in, in a very sort of traditional European manner, you know, making those uh, links formally through marriage, the way in which the, the, the deposed kings and queens of France perhaps might have done uh, a generation uh, or so earlier. We know that his family links are important and he makes that sacrifice um, in relation to uh, his own personal affairs. We spoke, I think, two weeks ago about the genuine love that we seem to see from him in relation to Josephine. Um, but, you know, there's this notion that Josephine is the last word that parts his lips as he's dying. Um, but, of course, he divorces Josephine because they're not producing uh, children. He's not getting an heir from Josephine. So he marries again and ultimately uh, starts to forge a dynasty of sorts. Um, he also marries into um, uh, prominent uh, royal families. So he, he, he's, again, making those connections to status. Uh, and royalty once more, so, so playing up to things that don't necessarily fit into the agenda of the revolution. But again, the revolution is, as, a, as an idea, as something that arguably we've left behind at this point. We're onto a, a different part of the European uh, narrative here. Um, and again, in the second marriage, um, generally regarded to be happy, and he gets his son, who will ultimately be given the title of the King of Rome. And that narrative will be important as we go on. So just just be conscious of that 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 process of uh, dynasty building um, that Napoleon had in mind, and you can see it sort of summarised um, neatly here. If we can get it on the screen, try and neaten that up a little bit. Well, that'll have to do. Um, you just get a sense of um, those links that are being established. Um, so Louis, we, we talked about Louis before in a, in a French political context. Um, he 
uh, benefits by being made the king of what is referred to as Holland. Jerome, Napoleon's brother, the king of Westphalia. Um, Napoleon's marshal, uh, Bernadotte, king of Sweden. We talked about Sweden's role in the Napoleonic Wars. Um, brief, um, a brief flirtation with the... <laughs> with, with, um, the, the military engagements in those first few years of the 19th century um and what do they get in as a reward well they get a a, a french uh, military figure taking their throne and so napoleon is replacing kings uh, all the way across europe and you you might remember the the, the tiddy doll baker satire where napoleon is smashing up um the, the the baked goods the baked good effigies of former royals in Europe and he's baking himself a new batch of royals as well replacing uh, monarchical dynasties wherever he saw fit um, and you're seeing that quite neatly here sorry we missed um, Joseph up at the top becomes king of Naples later he becomes king of Spain you know he's, he's moving family members around to take the thrones of wherever he sees fit and wherever it is necessary and of course, we have the lineage here. Um, so uh, in terms of his uh, relations, um, we mentioned Louis before, Louis, King of Holland. It is his son, Napoleon III, who will in the 19th century go on to become France's last monarch. Um, so the Napoleon narrative doesn't stop with uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, we see another Napoleon come to the fore in the, in the relative turmoil, the political turmoil of Europe in the 19th century. We already referenced this before, that the revolution in France is sort of small fry in comparison to the revolutions that break up all across Europe in the middle of the 19th century. And there is a Napoleon from the same lineage who's sitting on the French throne in the midst of all this. Um, and there he is, and he goes on to have his lineage as well. So the Napoleonic family continues to grow and become of prominence and has a legacy that runs uh, into the 19th century, which I am sure uh, our Napoleon would have been delighted about because um, that's partially what he was looking for. Legacy building is an important part of this, and there are suggestions that Napoleon is trying to outdo some of those great earlier empires and and again, leadership legacies. He compares himself. Well, we're already seeing him compare himself uh, to Caesar, but we also see these comparisons uh, to Charlemagne as well. Just um, referring himself to you know the, the great empires of the Germans, the king of the Romans, challenging uh, Charlemagne himself. Um, so you know, with this sort of rhetoric spurring around, and this slide uh, coupled with um, now let's just scale down to this. You're looking at the sort of titles that Napoleon is giving himself. He's Emperor of France. He's briefly King of Italy. Um, he becomes the protector of the Confederation of the Rhine. He's collecting these titles as he goes. Um, and we've already seen comparisons, like, like literal physical comparisons made in statues between Napoleon and Caesar as well. So that, that aspiration to be associated with the great empire builders of European history to be held in the same regard as them seems to be something that feeds into Napoleon's aspirations. And we know this is a man of ambition. That, that's, that's undeniable. Um, and in terms of where he's reaching out to, there are, of course, overlaps in terms of uh, scale and ambition. Um, one of the things, I think one of the last things we're going to talk about was just a brief mention of the Bastille Elephant Fountain, which is sort of, sort of sim symbolic, if you like, of um, uh, how things play out for Napoleon. This was going to be a, a great... Uh, I think it was originally supposed to be in bronze, but I think they, they only managed to make it out of uh, a sort of a wooden frame, a decorated wooden frame. Um, it was going to be a great uh, testament to Napoleon's achievement, this huge uh, elephant uh, that would stand in the centre of Paris. Um, this is indicative of Napoleon's ego and ambition, but the unrealized ambition. This thing is never finished um, and is ultimately teared down as it becomes just a haven of uh, decay, full of rats in particular, and becomes sort of a breeding ground for pestilence in the middle of Paris as the thing starts crumbling around itself. Um, it would have been a remarkable thing to see in person. And you might remember um, that engraving that we saw 
of the Musée, de, uh, Musée Napoléon, when uh, the Louvre is rebranded in Napoleon's name, there was a scale replica of this, a sort of a template for the great elephant that would have stood in the middle of Paris. But of course, it's never realised, um, just as Napoleon's plans for Europe are never realised, perhaps indicative of him overreaching once more. Um, but yeah, those are the quick things I just wanted to run through. I'm probably doing them uh, quicker than um, I might do otherwise, but I just wanted to make sure you had a chance to, to just uh, have my words over the remaining slides that we had uh, from this week. And this is the question I was going to leave you with. Um, the question remaining, why was France so content taking on an emperor so soon after the death of monarchy? Literal death, executions and whatnot. Um, it does seem somewhat inconsistent, if you like, um, that only a matter of a few years, relatively speaking, earlier on, had they executed Louis, they execute Marie Antoinette, and then turn over power by popular plebiscite, however corrupt it might have been, to a single figurehead, to a single uh, man who is essentially operating as a king. Um, it seems completely inconsistent. And yet, was the acceptance of Napoleon uh, a desire to hark back to the relative stability of nobility and monarchy? So, okay, perhaps under Louis, there may have been huge imbalances in relation to taxation and complete unfairness to the way in which people lived their lives. And yet the people weren't being chased down and being mass executed. We weren't seeing hundreds of people losing their lives on a weekly basis to the guillotine. Um, there may have been a degree of censorship, but nowhere near as much censorship as there was during the revolution itself. You know, did Napoleon offer a way to sort of reach back to a more stable, simpler time where there was just one guy wearing a crown who made all the decisions and you just sort of put up with it and went along with things. Maybe. Maybe. I'm not saying that is the narrative. I'm just saying it's an, an interpretation which you can throw at it. It's a question that perhaps we'll revisit formally in our class this time next week. Um, but it's worth having a think about because it does seem incongruous with the way in which the revolution evolved. But maybe putting all of the power and authority of the nation into a single figurehead male dominant uh, authority figure um, was an example of the sort of the revolution collapsing in on itself being consumed uh, by its own energy if you like i don't know it's an interesting one but one we'll talk about again anyway Please accept my apologies again for not quite managing to squeeze everything in before there was a very unhappy child breaking in on us. Um, but we got there. And fingers crossed next week it will be relatively quiet and calm as well. So we'll leave it there. I look forward to seeing you guys next week where we'll be talking. Uh, what have you got for next week? This is the next slide. The Napoleonic Code. If you like your early 19th century French legislation, then this is going to be the session for you. So uh, I look forward to seeing you for uh, a lot of uh, documentary analysis of political uh, reform and legislation. It's good stuff. Thrilling. See you then.